Good evening all, and welcome. Something I don't do often, but since it's September, I feel like we deserve a fresh bout of cryptid stories. So I hope you're ready, because it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. My family is Russian. Both my parents are from Siberia, in the northern part of Russia, and were born in a city called Omsk. Anyway, a few days ago my dad and I got into a conversation that kept deviating from the original topic, and eventually reached a point where we started talking about paranormal occurrences in our lives. I asked him why he believes in yetis as a long time ago he told me that he believed in them, but never explained why. My dad is not the type of guy who believes in paranormal activity. He believes ghosts and aliens are all far-fetched nonsense, and it was very much to my surprise that he openly believes in yetis, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, whatever you call it. He sits up straight, clears his throat, and then tells me, the following story. My dad is 51 years old, and in his 20s, he was serving time in the military. He was in a place called Sputnik, a village close to the Russian border with Norway. If you look it up, you can still see the barracks and the whole military camp itself. Pretty fascinating. All heavy duty military supplies were always stored far away from any human activity, typically in a forest. One day, a group of 10 people, one of whom is my father, were tasked to go on an expedition to the warehouse to restock military supplies in the camp. This required many people because loading up the trucks with very heavy equipment and ammunition was a rather gruelling task. My father gets in the truck with the others and they're on the road. They reach the place far later than anticipated because of something along the lines of, we got a flat tire. The place they were going to was located near a city that's on the bank of one of the hundreds of rivers you can see if you look on a map. The place was called Lover Zero. They get there during the night. The only thing that was illuminating the forest were the stars, since it was so dark and everyone was so tired that they decided to do a little sleepover in the warehouse. They slept over at a dugout not too far away. Once they get there, everyone takes their spot on the floor and says goodnight. But no matter how much my dad was tired, he simply couldn't sleep. He stayed up for another 30 minutes before standing up and seeing everyone with their eyes open. No one was asleep either. He had thought he was the only one awake, but he wasn't. The thing that was keeping him up was a sense of discomfort that he couldn't explain, and he decided to share this with the others. Everyone nods and says that they were all experiencing the exact same thing, and that it wouldn't let them rest peacefully. After another half hour, the discomfort has now evolved into mild fear and panic. At this point, everyone is really concerned because they've all got to wake up early tomorrow to move heavy boxes and sleeping of course is essential. They keep laying in silence when all of a sudden they hear a very strong thump on the roof of the building. The thumping persists, and it sounds as if someone extremely heavy is walking on the roof. Now, this roof was wooden. It was a sod roof with grass covering it, and my dad could tell for a fact it was someone walking because of the creaking that the boards made. Simultaneously, everyone, as discovered the next day, begins hyperventilating, and everyone's heart begins beating extremely fast. The thumping this creature was making was so loud it resonated in my dad's ears, and he felt his inside shake. One of the guys passed out. At a certain point, the creature descends from the roof and starts walking around the dugout, and one of the guys that was proud enough to open his eyes, looked around and said that the creature was peeking in, but since it was dark, he could only see a silhouette. Eventually, what it was that caused all of this left, 
and everyone tried to go back to sleep. The next day, one of my dad's buddies asked a passing local about this phenomenon, and he said it was completely in the ordinary, and even gave it a specific name, which unfortunately, my dad does not remember. Also, consider the fact that this all happened during the times of the Soviet Union. As you may or may not know, the Soviet Union was a complete atheist state. No cults, no belief in spirits, no religion. And people who believed in that sort of stuff were frowned upon. My father and the nine other soldiers are ideologically packed elite troops. And honestly, hearing this from him sounded crazy. And I know for a fact it was real. I have some friends near Shiprock that are big into researching about Bigfoot and skinwalkers. They've been featured in shows like Finding Bigfoot, Coast to Coast AM, and countless podcasts that speak about the paranormal. And on several History Channel programs, these people are the real deal. A few years ago, my wife and I were on a vacation, and part of our trip would be driving through their town. Taking advantage of this opportunity, we decided to spend a few nights out there and hang out with them. We met up, went to dinner, and talked about our personal paranormal experiences, and recent Bigfoot or Skimwalker sightings. I wanted to experience searching for Skimwalker evidence for myself, so during the course of our conversation, I asked if they were willing to take me out on the field the following night and search for the elusive creatures. Being that most of them are Native American, they were very hesitant, and only one of them agreed to it. The rest of the group decided to meet us on my last night there to take me to Sasquatch instead. The following day, my friend arrived to the hotel and picked me up at 5pm. We must have driven for about an hour and a half out of town, mostly through dirt roads to a place locally known to have a lot of skinwalker activity. By the time we reached the location, everything was dark. He shuts the trick off, and like in most paranormal investigations, we sit and wait, trying to listen for anything out of the ordinary. For the most part, it was quiet. Other than a bunch of annoying crickets making noises, nothing much happens. My buddy told me about recent sightings and his own encounters with these medicine men. Long story short, after about an hour, he told me to get out of the truck, walk outside, and towards the front of it to try and listen out for anything. He said that if anything happened, he would immediately turn the lights on and light up whatever might be there. Basically, he wanted me to be human skinwalker bait. I was hesitant for a moment, but since I had a weapon on me, I thought it to be okay. But I also knew that bullets would not do much to a skinwalker. Just as I had made my decision to get out of his truck, the night turned ever darker. This wasn't a regular dark night type of dark. This darkness had a purpose to it. It felt extremely ominous. It also got extremely cold, and we both noted that all the little critters had suddenly gone quiet. After hesitating for a while, I decided to open the truck doors to get out. But as I did, and had my foot ready to touch the ground, we heard a loud whistle. It wasn't a distant whistle, like the air brings towards you. This was next to us. It sounded like it was inside the cab of a truck. Obviously, I thought someone had snuck up on us or that my body was trying to mess with me. But when I looked at him, he had turned white. The expression on his face had totally changed, seeing that he was afraid. That naturally put me on high alert. I tried to snap him out of it, but he seemed frozen in place. The whistling continued for a few times, and I was screaming at my friend at this point. Eventually, he came to his senses and began to react to what was happening around us. He then immediately turned his truck on. We grabbed our flashlight and looked all over the place to see what the hell was out there, but of course we found no one. Feeling nervous, and him being native, we decided to leave the place right away. 
The next day, him and a few other friends picked me up again and took me out at night to search for Bigfoot, near Shipwalk Mountain. While investigating, we found what's known in the field as a Bigfoot nest. Inside the nest were tons of dried out eaten animals, carcasses and bones, mostly deer. As we're trying to figure out what lived there, we suddenly heard a loud yelp. It wasn't a coyote or mountain lion type of yelp. This is the yelp you felt in your bones. You could feel the vibration in your chest. Of course, we all started searching around to see what it was. I didn't see anything. But two of my partners saw something move up on the ridge. They were scared enough to draw and cock their weapons. And about 10 minutes later, we began to hear several footsteps all around us. We couldn't see who or what it was, because it was really dark, even with our flashlights turned on. After hearing these footsteps getting closer and closer, and less afraid of us, we ended up leaving the area hastily. These are my personal experiences and they're all true. I don't expect many people to believe me. My late friend, JC Johnson and I talked many times about what happened. I'm still in contact with everyone who took me out on those nights. I still go out to the field here in Nevada, trying to see if I can catch anything. This was told to me by my dad. First and foremost, my dad was not a believer in aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, or portals, but he couldn't explain this away. My dad was a raccoon hunter. He owned several dogs and had many friends that also hunted with him. This happened in the 60s. He said one night him and a buddy of his took their dogs on a late night run. There was a small conservation area about five miles from our house with picnic tables and primitive camp sites. A natural spring runs through the area and it's just a beautiful place. He said they let their dogs out and were sitting on the tailgate of the truck listening to them run. He said that they managed to get a raccoon in a tree and hid. Him and his buddy walked to where they were. The dogs were highly trained to stay at the tree and not leave until he arrived. He said the dogs got leashed up and were waiting for the truck. When the dogs started whining and whimpering, acting completely out of character, his big male hound cowered down and took off, breaking the hold my dad had on him. He said they heard a noise like nothing either of them had ever heard before. Mind you, these two men had been in the Missouri woods all their lives. He said it was a growing noise and they could hear footsteps circling them. They both had headlights on and both of them tried to see whatever it was, but kept it out the light. He said it started chattering like to itself. He took out a firearm one that he carries and shot it into the air a few times, and the stalking and chattering just stopped. He then said they took the dogs and quickly made their way back to the truck. My dad's old male dog was there waiting for them. He said the dogs were acting so strangely cowering and trembling. They got their dogs loaded up, and when they checked the time, over two hours were missing. He said the tree the dogs were at weren't very far from the truck. So walking to them, getting the dogs and back to the truck would have been at least half hour at most. He said they never discussed it with anyone but each other. He didn't tell me until I was grown. After he passed, I asked my mum if he told her. And she said the night it happened, and he was scared. My dad was never scared of anything, but that he couldn't explain. He was pale just telling me the story. He said they were stalked by something with heavy footsteps that chattered to itself. This was in the summer, late at night. When I was really young, probably about five or six, my family went camping. 
at the tippy top of the mountain. You really couldn't get higher on said mountain. There was a lake and we were camping next to it. So of course my family was fishing, my dad and my mum, my uncle and I were on the shore trying to get some fish. Across the shore on the other side of the small lake, my dad had noticed a huge brown and black humanoid figure, just standing still and facing right at us. It had to have been at least eight feet tall, maybe even taller since it was so far away. So like any human would naturally do, my dad tried yelling at it since he had thought it was a prank of some sorts. I don't remember what my dad said, but I remember the sound of the creature, the one that it made back. It wasn't anything we understood. We just kind of stood there. It was screaming unintelligibly. It did however sound like it knew what it was trying to say like it was trying to communicate with us in its own language. Then the creature took off fast. Mind you, the entire time he'd been on two feet like a human. He turned and began running towards the forest and was out of sight in seconds. He had to have been running at least 25 to 30 miles per hour. My brother, grandpa and dog tried chasing it, which was definitely the smart thing to do, and went to where we had seen him at the direction he left in. They did find a huge lump of black hair that was stuck in a barbed wire fence, although I'm not certain if it was from that creature. Tell me why we didn't leave. We still spent the night in the tents. It was very windy and I don't think anyone slept. I think about it from time to time, but it honestly isn't that rare of an encounter here in Utah. I've seen UFOs, and my siblings claim to have seen skimwalkers. I promise my family is not a bunch of kooks. A friend and myself were walking home at three o'clock in the morning, about six kilometers across a small town in New South Wales, Australia, from one friend's place to another, which is where I was living at the time. We were only about one kilometer away from home on about a 500 meter stretch of a straight road. We were walking along a sidewalk. He was pushing my BMX and we were just chatting as we usually did. When all of a sudden something caught my eye. Two greyhound looking dogs, but larger than your average dogs in height, probably twice the size. They ran out of a block of flats or apartments, whatever you call it and jumped the brick mailboxes on the side of the footpath onto the other side of the road, which stood about three to four feet high. Both of these dogs landed in the middle of the road, then ran in the opposite direction to which we were walking. As they ran further, they grew larger and larger in size. While they grew larger, they seemed to begin to stand up on their hind legs and morph into some large muscular Bigfoot or werewolf looking creature and in my mind, I could not comprehend what I saw. These creatures ran around the corner in the exact direction we walked from, and about five to 10 seconds after they turned the corner, we heard what sounded like a female child scream. At that point, we both looked at each other, and I could tell he saw what I had seen, as he was about to haul ass and bail on me on my bike. I said, screw that, jumped on the handlebars, and he pedaled, the likes of which I've never seen. I don't think he slipped a pedal for the rest of the trip home. When we got home, we locked the doors and closed the windows, and I asked him to explain exactly what he saw, and to no surprise, it was exactly what I had witnessed. He was an indigenous Australian, as was his elder brother. We explained the experience to him, and he said that it was probably a Yowie, which I believed at the time, but this story is not typical to Yowie sightings in Australia. Safe to say this scared me to go out at night for quite a while. And we told a few people about the experience afterwards, but most of the time people would laugh or joke or say that we were on drugs or brought up hairy man, which is a slang term for Yowie while drinking. But I can assure the people hearing this, the same thing I told them. This experience happened and we were both completely sober. After the joking and carrying on, I pretty much kept this story to myself 
only telling a select few people who want to hear paranormal stories, and I don't try to convince anyone it's real or not. They can decide for themselves, but I know what I saw. About 20 years ago, after I graduated high school, I used to run traps to make extra money in the wintertime. Since I was pregnant with my daughter, any sort of extra income was necessary, since trapping is frowned upon oddly. My father had always told me about the creek I trapped in as being quite strange. We would always walk the creek to collect arrowheads and look for other Shawnee relics. So he would tell me stories about the Shawnee Native American tribe and their history and folklore. It was a very special spot to us. So when I began trapping, my father would tell me to respect the wildlife. Do not litter, kill humanely, and do not kill what does not need to be. So I built a great deal of appreciation to life, which led to my career in conservation. The only reason I state these things is to build context as to why I did what I did. About once a week while walking up the creek, I would hear whistling, like a human but in random patterns, and that would be along with the smell of sulfur and rotten eggs, which my dad told me was most likely a Bigfoot or skunk ape, and sightings had occurred as long as he could remember in our area. Then one time I was scanning down the tree line with my binoculars to check to see if I had any coyotes or foxes in my traps to save me the walking time. I'd seen a fairly medium sized tree swing dramatically a little past the tree line. So I head over there with my firearm hoping to sneak up on a bobcat or any medium sized animal that my point 22 could end fairly quickly. About three quarters of the way to the tree line, the swing stopped and I didn't see anything, but at least two of whatever it was began whistling and whooping further back in the forest. I continued to head up the creek, and it always stayed somewhat behind me, at a distance but never left. This was fairly interesting. Then one day, sadly, an oil fracking company purchased most of the land. They still gave me permission to trap, but they had a few accidents where the water got so nasty it killed just about everything. It broke my heart to see beavers, muskrats and some raccoons floating down the creek every time I went. But after they had installed their rigs and cleared some forest, things became a little more hostile. One day running traps, almost all of my traps had been ruined, bent, beaten and broken, and the remaining animals I caught were either stolen, ripped from the trap with one foot or leg still attached, and I even found a coyote that had been messed up bad. Fur torn, broken lower jaw and head beaten in. I felt like this was in retaliation to what the oil company had done, and I was being blamed, but it was still positive. For a few months afterwards, I would go to the store twice a week and buy a variety of apples, pears and a mixture of meat from the carcasses I had skinned, put it in a basket and leave it in the forest, hoping whatever it was would get it before anything else. Sometimes the basket would disappear, but always in about two days, everything was gone. One day, I believe it left me a present in return. Next to where I dropped off the basket, there were a hundred or more small sticks stacked very neatly, about 20 acorns and a deer antler. It made me feel happy. I do hope that I did help this creature out in this very sad moment of its life, though it may have been everything but a Bigfoot slash skunk ape, because I've never physically seen it or tracked it in the creeks. But all of my occurrences happened in the woods along the creek, so I really don't know. To this day, 20 years later, I still think of it. From time to time, I don't see a people for reason to be afraid of them. It was a sad but positive two winter seasons with it. Even if it was an animal I didn't recognize, I hoped I helped it in some way. This story happened back in the late 70s in Samarinda, Borneo, Indonesia. My dad used to work in a lumber mill there, doing lumber mill related work. He told me that this one time, 
There was a crowd of people gathered around what appeared to be a makeshift cage made by the locals. When he got a look at what was in there, as it was crowded by lots of people, he was surprised and shocked to see a big primate creature standing upright, about two meters tall. The hair of the primate was similar to that of an orangutan, and what is even weirder, is the primate creature appeared to be crying. So how did the ape end up in there you may ask? My father asked a local about it, and one of them said that one day, a man from the nearby village was missing when hunting. So of course, the villagers go to the forest in order to try and find him. But during the search, one of them found a huge footstep that was so large it simply couldn't be human. So they split into smaller parties to follow the track, and to their surprise, the missing guy was found on a tall tree, tied up in what appeared to be a nest of primates. So they helped him down, and that's when he told them that he had been taken by an upright standing ape. The villagers got curious, so the next day formed another search party to search for the ape instead. No one really knows how, but my dad said they found it, and that's how it wound up in that cage. My dad doesn't know what happened to the ape, but some of his colleagues said the villagers actually ended its life to avoid many more potential victims of being taken. The primate creature was allegedly female. The villagers speculated that it took the hunter to make a bride out of him. And that's the end of the story. I know this isn't a usual Bigfoot story, but I still found it compelling and had to share it with you guys. Back in 1947, when my grandmother was young, she used to live in a shared piece of land, Ejido, located in San Luis Potosí, Mexico. I can't remember the name of the shared land, but it was small, and there were barely a few houses on it. One day, she and her mother, my great-grandmother, went to visit a relative that lived near. But before leaving, my grandmother asked her dad to accompany them, but he refused and decided to stay as he was busy with other things. 20 minutes later, as they were walking, they began to hear whistles and strange noises coming from nearby bushes. My great grandmother told my grandmother that maybe her dad was making those noises because he wanted to scare them. They ignored the noises and arrived to the relative's house. They stayed there for several hours, but decided to leave when it started to get dark. Again, walking in the same road, they began to hear the whistles, but increasingly closer. My grandmother shouted her husband's name, telling him to stop scaring them, that they knew it was him. The whistles stopped, and now they began to hear sounds like a woman who was suffering or screaming. That was enough for them. Then they started running towards the house. While running, they heard screams and whistles even more. And once they arrived, they found my great grandfather deeply asleep. They awoke him and couldn't understand what just happened. They never heard the whistles or screams again. Years later, I read an article about Bigfoot encounters with people hearing whistles or a woman in distress. Then I thought that perhaps it might have been what was scaring my grandmother. Besides that weird story, they regularly saw the strangest lights in the sky coming down the mountain. They thought they were witches, and my grandma was really scared to go out at night because of it. She and her family saw a lot of strange things that couldn't be explained back in those days. They knew every part of the share land, and even what kind of animals lived there. Here in Mexico, we have tons of old stories regarding giants that were killed by the Aztecs or died during the wars with tribes. But for now, thanks for listening. I'm Garrett, a Western Paiute who grew up moving because my dad spent his career in the forest service. My original home is one of California's largest Indian reservations. I've been a hunter and overall enjoyed spending my time in the wilderness since I could remember walking. I started hunting big game at 10, 
without a hunting license until 14, because it was legal on the reservation, while living with my family for the summer until I go back to college in fall. I had the idea, which my dad and brother promptly agreed to, to go on an 11 mile backpacking trip in high country. We spent the next few hours packing our bags with what we would need for 48 hours, but potentially 72 just to be ready. The next day, we drove the 70 miles to the end of the last road in the area and began our hike. Excited to break my boots in and see the lake, I took the lead and by 4pm we made it to our spot, sitting at 8,000 feet elevation. We swam in the lake to wash the sweat off and then use the sun to dry off before it got dark. Mind you, we are in the northwestern USA, so at this elevation it could still freeze at night, even in July. It was a peaceful and an awesome place 81 miles from the closest town of 3,000 people, with the nearest city being 181 miles south. After we swam, dried off and ate dinner, I was ready to sleep along with both my dad and my brother. After spending the next hours looking at the satellites orbiting Earth and the stars with the occasional quasars, I was in my hammock drifting off to sleep. However, I didn't get to sleep that night, not even a minute, and I'm glad I didn't. I heard what sounded like three people walking on the boulders about 50 yards in front of us, right on the other side of the thicket. I'm 20 years old, 180 pounds and six foot two, along with being a college athlete, so I was cocky at first. I told my dad we have people near us, and to be ready. This is a weird place to see anyone, at all, ever. However, passing midnight is something that raised a red flag. He listened to me, but was asleep five minutes later, and my brother never woke up. I decided to keep watch, I knew what I heard, so, I kept my .38 revolver in my right hand with me, while still in my hammock. It's loaded and prepared for self-defense. All of a sudden, it got real. I heard someone or something charging me from the thicket. So thinking I wouldn't have time to turn on my headlamp, I cocked my revolver and pointed towards the sound. While praying for protection in my head, nothing came out the thicket. It went silent. And again, being too scared to sleep, I got up like a dumbass without my boots on to try and find what it was. I didn't find anything, not even tracks. So I got more wood, kept the fire burning and tried to warm up. It was 32 degrees with wet soil, so my feet were freezing. Right as the fire stoked up, I heard what sounded like a man run across the river. I looked over there with my headlamp, but didn't see anything. Then I asked myself, who the hell would run across four feet of running water up here at night? Just because I felt like I was being watched, I looked back across and this time saw big green eyes and grey looking skin that was see through. None of it made sense. It was at least seven feet tall and didn't look alive, let alone human. So I prayed to the Most High and asked for protection. For the next three hours I heard rocks being thrown in the river and never desired to sleep until the next afternoon when I was home. I don't know what it was, but I'm glad I prayed. I don't think my pistol would have helped. I asked my aunt about it, and she said it was most likely a spirit who for some reason was angry, or maybe a more sinister entity created after a war or some kind of violence that took place in the area. I still don't know for sure, I will go further up into the next lake, that's another 13 miles to see if I can find what's going on. Growing up in northern Idaho, I found the native law surrounding Sasquatch very compelling because it resonated with the Islamic folklore of jinn that I grew up hearing about from various relatives from the Indian subcontinent. Jinn, like many of the native legends, are shapeshifters and exist mainly in secluded areas of wilderness. They are often associated with strong sulfuric odours, more commonly associated with demons, devils and the like. And it turns out, countless reports of Bigfoot slash Sasquatch too. 
For an undergraduate project years ago, I interviewed famed cryptozoologist Grover Kranz at WSU. He had analysed the famous Patterson footage down to a gait in proportion to size, movement, muscle beneath the skin, the infamous torso turn and of course the apparent breasts. It was fascinating, but not nearly as fascinating as all the anecdotal evidence he received from park rangers, hunters, farmers and hikers. Krantz explained that most folks almost always bristled at his inquiries about sightings for fear of ridicule. Once Kratz earned their trust and assured them it was for research, he heard some fascinating stories that often defy explanation, including vanishings, mysterious sounds and impossible happenings. For example, a farmer apparently shot one point blank only to have it disappear on him. The sulfurous stench of course was mentioned ad nauseum. Krantz, however, maintained until his death that Bigfoot was some kind of elusive primate and nothing more. Now, if you really want to put on your paranormal hat with me, my own mum told an incredible story when I was around seven or eight, well before I had any interest in Bigfoot. She said a lady would come to the house on occasion to help cook and clean when my mother was around 10 or 11, while living in rural parts of the Punjab. This particular lady apparently told tales and whatnot, according to my mum anyway. And this lady insisted that she knew of a man who had befriended a jinn. In Islam, jinn have moral agencies just as humans do. As such, many can be good. In Mecca, there is even a mosque dedicated to the jinn. She had begged and begged to meet the fantastical creature, but the man refused. And one day the man finally relented. Or so she told my mum. He told her to go into the far room and there she would meet the creature. Now I know this sounds far fetched, and is just a late night tale on Reddit, best met with incredulity. But what the woman saw often makes my hair stand on edge, considering the time, the place, and when my mum casually told it to me in the first place. Again, I was maybe seven or eight, with really no clue about Bigfoot or Jin. Before running out of the room in a panic, the woman swore she saw a large, darkened creature that almost reached the ceiling covered in hair, and had a face, oddly like a man. I've shared this story with many of my friends and people that are interested in the unknown. This happened to me and my family back in 2001. I was about 10 years old at the time. We lived in a small rural town pronounced Aladala on the south coast of Australia. This is a quiet town for beachgoers, fishermen, and people on holidays from the city, as well as plenty of retirees. Nothing exciting happens here. It's the same monotonous day to the same life that never changes. We were celebrating my grandmother's birthday at her and my grandfather's house one night. They lived at the backside of the town on a rurally type setting, paddocks, cows, older style homes, with acres of land and lots of bush on a road called Slaughterhouse Road. This is where the local slaughterhouse used to be, hence the name. My grandparents were Italian, so food was in abundance. Parents chatting about how good the seafood was, just your usual Italian birthday celebration. Being so young, late nights seemed distant for my two brothers, sister and I. So my mother decided that we could call it a night and head home, as it was 9pm and past our bedtime. As we said our goodbyes, we loaded into the car one by one. I called dibs on the front seat, which I kind of regret. My mother was the last to jump in. In the meantime, I was grabbing the top end of my seatbelt to strap in for the ride home, when I had caught some movement from outside the car window no further than about eight feet or so away. We were parked in front of the garage, where I saw this thing right where the brickwork ended. It led into the paddocks at the back of the property. I was put into a state of confusion mixed with shock at exactly what I was looking at. Humanoid in appearance, this thing crawled on all four appendages, slowly moving out of sight. 
As it crept past the side of the garage, I say it was about six feet long, thin and malnourished, with its bones pushing against its skin. The texture of the skin was like polished leather, pale white, grey and slimy in appearance. As it crawled, the shoulder blades protruded up, like when you see a cheetah on the way it walks around. No tail, its head was just out of view, as it had already passed before I got a glimpse of it. My stomach churned as the hairs stuck from my skin. My first reaction was to turn to my mother for safety and reassurance that my eyes had been deceiving me. And as I turn around for reassurance, I see this furthest thing away from it. Her face was pale, drained of all colour and expression. I waited for any sense of normality to return to the situation when she looked me dead in the eyes and said, Lock the doors. My two brothers and sister and I did the same thing, slammed the doors and put the lock down. The car was quickly flung into reverse and we were backing out the driveway like we were recreating a strunt drive from a Hollywood movie. As we turned down the dark narrow bush covered streets to head home, I still needed that reassurance. I asked my mother what that was. She hesitated and just said, I'm sure it's just a dog. There are a few scrap rods around here. I'm sure it's just one of the guard dogs that gotten loose. I knew what she had seen, but took the most plausible excuse to calm myself down. Years later, as I got older, I revisited that night with my mother and asked her if she remembered that night outside of grandma's house and claimed it wasn't a big dog. She looked at me dead in the eyes and said, No, darling. I told you kids so that you wouldn't be scared. I'm 28 years old and still remember that night like it happened yesterday. I reignite my memory of it every time a friend or new acquaintance asks about scary stories. I smile and say, you think that's scary? Wait till you hear this. I remember this story as clearly as the day my father told it to me. He's no longer with us. He passed away January 15th, 2019. But he and I spoke about this several times. But the first time he told me is the one that remains. He was what they call a pathfinder in Vietnam and had the uncanny ability to blend into his environment like a chameleon. He was helping a friend who had gotten a piece of land in the wilds of Alaska for homesteading. He said he observed this creature, this giant, for about 15 minutes. My dad was 5'10", and he estimated this giant to be 15 feet tall. He said it was fair skinned with a long beard and had bear skins on his chest and shoulders and deer or moose skins on his lower half. He said the giant had very crude shoes of fur as well. What struck me as crazy was the fact that my dad said the giant was whistling. Then it made a deep grunt sound and two wolves appeared and they hunted together like a pack. He said they disappeared soon after getting a nice deer. He couldn't believe what he'd seen. He told his friend and they went to the local tribal grounds and asked around and found out that many hunters had seen them. They think maybe it was a family because a few men claimed to see a female about 12 to 13 feet tall and a smaller one with her. It amazed me and I have researched a lot into different cultures to see if there was giant law and it seems that it's mostly in colder climates. In regards to why they're not very often seen, there are very few of them. They are seen every few years or tracks are found and these are almost always in enormous wilderness areas where there are no people to see them 99% of the time. They don't live near civilized areas the way Bigfoot will. So they are just not frequently spotted by us as a result. It is also likely they're far more intelligent than Bigfoot. Evidence the occasional sightings with one carrying a sack or basket, footwear, goat hide, clothing and stone age type weapons. Not all of them are this bright according to the stories but they could sure avoid us quite easily, especially with their ability to move large distances and across difficult terrain swiftly. 
I have a pretty creepy story to share with you. And although I never saw a UFO, I saw an entity mostly associated with them. I grew up in the USSR, in now northern Belarus, until I was 13. 37 years ago, my mother and I saw an entity outside looking at us through the window. It was hairless, pale white, huge bulging black eyes, and it had teeth that were very small, very well spaced. It was skinny and pointed, almost like an anglerfish. We hid for hours until we heard my father drive towards the house. We both looked out the window to see the being standing up from behind a wall. It was much taller than a human, hiding behind that wall, and I believe it was waiting for us to come out. My father came up the driveway. We saw the silhouette of its body from the back. It was hunched over, staring at the car. My father saw in the headlights what it looked like perfectly. He drove at it and it ran into the brush around the house. It never made a sound. It seemed smart and cautious, and the overwhelming feeling I got that night was that it was vicious and violent. My parents spoke with police and were so horrified about the encounter. And after speaking with them or KGB, we were relocated and forced to never speak of the event to anyone ever again. Within 30 hours, I was living in a new home nearly a hundred kilometers away. I've searched for so many years for an explanation. I've spoken with government officials in Belarus. I have interviewed with people who lived near our home about 10 years ago, yet I have no answers. If people might speak with me via messages, feel free. I seriously want to get to the bottom of this. I used to live on a large property with a lake, 29 acres of land and heavily forested. I was playing and was about 11 or 12 at the time, outside by myself, right when the sun was setting. It was fall and there were barely any lights outside, except maybe for a light on the house about 50 feet away from the playset that I was on. Behind the playset were really tall trees and not many new sapling trees anywhere near because we had been clearing them out. I know specifically that there were no trees short enough to have some owl or animal sit on because all the pine trees were mature and taller than my two story house. My mum came out to tell me that dinner was almost ready. When she did this, she turned on the outside light on the back porch, illuminating the area so I could see. I was on the swing set at the time. I started to get up and I turn around and I think to find my flip flops and I see two bright eyes reflecting the light outside the light, looking at me about 20 feet away. The eyes were well above any human size and were large, about seven to seven and a half feet off the ground. I stopped stunned and really scared. I was really familiar with the woods right behind the swing set and I knew something unnatural was looking at me. I couldn't see the body, but all I saw were the eyes. The eyes looked at me and I tried to get an understanding and thought of a massive humanoid. It was a Bigfoot. Remind you that no animal could have levitated in that spot for five seconds, and there were no perches or anything that would suspect critters, not with eyes that size. I ran inside, locked all my doors, and couldn't think straight for the next few days. Let's just say I rarely went outside after that. Just remembering this, gives me chills. My dad once told me about something he saw in the woods near Bethlehem. He grew up there and there's this wooded area up in a hilly suburb of the town that he and his high school buddies used to mess around in when he was a teen. He told me that at one point he and a buddy during the day went exploring in the woods and found what looked like a really weird camp up there with this hole in the ground like cave. The camp was rough, but I think he mentioned a rock pile that could have been a fire pit. Apparently he and his buddies were exploring the area when he heard scuttling sounds from the cave 
and turned to see something super pale and humanoid looking at him from further up inside. Like a bald mutant albino, is about how he described it. He and the other dude ran their asses off back to my dad's place, and never went up there again from what he told me. My dad's mum didn't like the place where my dad had seen whatever that was, but I'm not sure if she knew what my dad had actually seen. As a kid, she always told me to keep away from that particular patch of woods. Now, those woods are just loaded with junkies, perhaps, but were they trying to make something up to scare me from going there? I doubt it. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I do hope that you guys enjoyed tonight's video. It was originally supposed to be Bigfoot stories, but there wasn't really enough, and um, that's why it's 15. And so we smushed some together. Bit of everything really, all cryptids of course. Really interesting ones. The giants, never really hear stories about giants. Creepy there. I remember one, I think it was in an army video in fact where these army people are in the Middle East, and they claim that there's a giant in this cave, and they go and I think they see it and they either shoot it or they all leave. But I do know that it made believers out of those who were there. Pretty interesting. Really good stories today. I mean, I really liked them. I love sharing these with you guys. If you enjoyed the stories and the video, you know what to do. Don't forget that you could sign up to Patreon to receive rewards, or become a member to receive other rewards. Rewards, rewards, rewards. Thanks guys. But for now, it's time for me to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.